This is the holy city of Jerusalem, a city that's loved by Jews, by Arabs, by Christians. It's the city that killed the prophets. It's where Christ was crucified, and it's where he'll come again to rule and reign on this planet. The most prominent, outstanding physical feature of what you see is the golden dome of the rock. Right below it is the, the eastern gate where Christ himself will pass through when he comes to take his throne. But before that time, there's a great controversy over the Temple Mount area. Today, the Jews cannot go up on top of the Temple Mount area. They must worship below at the Wailing Wall. What a paradox. For 1967, when they liberated Eastern Jerusalem, they had the opportunity to take control of the Temple Mount area, but Moshe Dayan didn't do it. What a dilemma. Today, there's this tremendous desire to rebuild the Third Temple, but it's impossible. They just can't do it unless they risk uh, World War III. So it's quite a dilemma for the Jewish people, and it's created a great deal of tension between the Arabs and the Jews. This is the resting place of David Ben-Gurion, Israel's modern-day Moses. It was Ben-Gurion who became Israel's first prime minister in 1948, leading the Jewish people from mere residency in Palestine to statehood in 1948. Once again, coming home after some 2,000 years of absence, the Jews were now back in the land and recognized by the world governing body, the United Nations, not as Palestine, but as Israel. Ben-Gurion's grave overlooks this spectacular ravine commemorating the spot where Moses passed through some 3,500 years earlier after having received the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai on his way to possess the Promised Land. In addition to the Ten Commandments, Moses, according to the Lord's instruction on Mount Sinai, was to construct a tent of meeting, a tabernacle, a mobile meeting place where the Lord would descend and counsel with Moses and the leaders of Israel. For 40 years of wandering, this tent of meeting was administered by the Kohites, a priestly class of men from the tribe of Levi. The tabernacle was furnished and was replete with all the implements, vessels, and instruments of worship necessary to accurately serve the Lord. But after they crossed over into the Promised Land, the Lord raised up King David several hundred years later, and it was he, King David, who had it in his heart to build a permanent residence for God's presence. David received detailed instruction for its exact design and gave the plans to his son Solomon, who later became king and built the first permanent temple on the Temple Mount site. But Israel's moral and spiritual decline brought God's judgment and led to the destruction of the second temple, only this time it was by the Romans in 70 AD. The Temple Mount area lay desolate for centuries, a garbage heap, until the Moslems came around 700 years later and constructed the Mosque of Aska and the shrine known as the Dome of the Rock. The shrine marks the spot where, according to Moslem tradition, Mohammed their prophet allegedly ascended into heaven, and this is why it is Islam's third most sacred site. But since the Jews' most recent return in 1948, always haunting them was the emptiness and longing for their temple, for it was the temple that was the centerpiece of their religious faith in God. They were back in the land, but the temple was lacking. The religious Jews, however, knowing the scriptures, recognized that a third temple was predicted according to their great prophet Ezekiel. The Arabs, however, angered over the establishing of a Jewish state in 1948, and under the dark cloud of Islam sought to destroy the newly established state of Israel. They immediately attacked by launching a war right after the Declaration of Independence. Repeatedly and continually over the decades, they have attacked Israel, but each time they were defeated and repulsed. Curiously, after each attack, Israel only prospered by obtaining more and more land. Once again, war struck in 1967 when a contingent of Arab nations assaulted her from three sides. In only six days, she again defeated and beat back her enemies, but this time, Jerusalem was liberated. 
However, the Dome of the Rock and the Mosque of Aska were left in the hands of the Moslems. The Jews were still without their beloved temple and the rightful, the historical, and the traditional place to build it, the Temple Mount. Nevertheless, with their faith in God, the Jews began to restore and focus their attention on the land itself. The barren land, blighted by plunder and hundreds of years of neglect, began to bloom and become fruitful. The deserts were cultivated and planted, the Sea of Galilee was tapped, and the land was irrigated. The rains returned and the flowers bloomed. The land was extensively cultivated and Israel became exceedingly prosperous. But after all their labor, energy, and hard work, the Jews, by heavy pressure from the United Nations, have been put upon and excessively pressured to give back to the Palestinians vast portions of the land they have so diligently worked. Already many concessions have been made by the Jews exchanging land for the promise of peace, but the relentless push for more by the Muslims and Arabs goes on. In traveling through Israel and going up into the Golan Heights, we ran across this field of corn. Now this is not corn in Oklahoma, or it's not corn in Iowa, it's corn on the Golan Heights. And it's not May or June, this is the latter part of August. No one grows corn in August. Nobody plants corn in July, but they do here in Israel, one crop after another. And remember, this is on the Golan Heights, where there was once, a few years ago, nothing but rock and uh, grass and nothing growing at all. But yet Israel has cleared this land. They're growing orchards and crops of every kind, one after another, crop rotation. And this corn, just look at this corn. It's uh, loaded down with ears, and look how thick it is. We don't plant corn this thick in Oklahoma or Iowa. We don't get this many ears of cor corn on a stalk. But it's amazing, and it concerns us that Israel is now being asked to trade this land back for a worthless piece of paper. While the Jews have allowed the Palestinians back into the land, the hostilities continue to rage. The age-old feud of Esau and Jacob continues to smolder and daily threatens to reignite into a full-scale conflagration. As more and more land has been ceded back, Islam's insatiable appetite has now brought the issue of the Temple Mount controversy to the forefront and has focused the world's attention on this most untenable situation. It seems the Temple Mount, the most holy site for both Jews and Muslims, will not be conceded by either. Who will control? This is the unanswerable question. Neither side seems to be willing to yield any position. The negotiations are stalled. The Temple Mount issue has become perhaps the flashpoint and trigger for global trouble. Jerusalem has become indeed a burdensome stone. We're here in Timna Park just north of Alat Israel at a model of the tabernacle and in just a moment we're going to be going to Jerusalem with uh, Rabbi Chaim Richman and Ken Klein and this is going to be an amazing interview concerning the controversy over the temple site Jerusalem as a burdensome stone for all people with the center being the temple site the Muslims and the Arab nations, they want control over the temple. Of course, Israel wants control over the temple. Also, the Vatican also has its own ideas concerning control over the temple site. So why can't this matter be resolved? And why is this little tiny piece of ground in the center of Jerusalem a matter of world controversy that 
bars a peaceful settlement over this entire area. Well, Ken Klein and Rabbi Richmond is going to be dealing with these issues. And this is a very important interview, and I would encourage you to listen to every word by Rabbi Richmond. Here now is Ken Klein and Rabbi Richmond. We're here with Rabbi Richmond from the Temple Institute, and uh, he's going to share with us about the mission statement that uh, they, they adhere to and tell us more about what's going on today in this uh, restoration of the Temple. Rabbi, could you share with us uh, what your institute's all about, please? The Temple Institute is dedicated to the concept of the positive commandment that Israel is entrusted with to rebuild the Holy Temple in every generation. Essentially our goal is to try to fulfill this commandment of and you shall make for me a sanctuary that I will dwell among you as best as possible. And the way that we are going about that in addition to research and the development of educational curriculum that are in use all over the world and a number of scientific projects, the main focal point of our work is the actual restoration of the vessels that can be used in the temple. And these things are not models or replicas or copies, but are actually real, made according to the exact requirements of the biblical law, according to every nuance of the way God gave it over to Moses, as embellished also in the oral tradition. So these things can actually be used in the rebuilt temple. Uh, to date, we've constructed over three quarters of the vessels that are necessary for the restoration of temple service. This past year has been a, a very important um, milestone year for the Institute in that we have created the three central vessels for the sanctuary itself, the golden menorah, the candelabra of seven branches, the golden incense altar, and the table of the showbread. So uh, this is already really um, just a tremendous uh, breakthrough for Israel, knowing that we have these three vessels in the world today. Now, one of the uh, major questions that are always uh, asked is, um, where is the temple going to be rebuilt? So of course, the temple doesn't go in Cincinnati or Paris, but a few meters in this direction on the Temple Mount. And that, of course, is not uh, my idea or your idea, but something that God chose, the only place on earth that God chose to rest His presence. And so uh, it's difficult, really, for many people to comprehend and to understand you know, to fathom how this is going to come about, considering the geopolitical reality of the situation as we have it today. I think it's important for us to stress, because there is unfortunately a tendency in the media and in a lot of areas, people kind of um, tend to um, throw together all those so-called temple enthusiasts in one pot. And they say, oh, those are the people that want to overthrow and that want to destroy the mosque and all that kind of thing. And this is really not the case. Our organization is a religious organization and our uh, goal is a religious goal, and that is to try to fulfill the commandment as best as possible. Uh, it's not a political organization. But again, on the other hand, I can't shy from the fact that that's where the temple belongs, and that's where it goes, and that's the destiny of the Jewish people. How it's going to come about is something else entirely, and I think that when we study the prophets of Israel, we begin to see that the major hallmark of that era is that it's a very special time of harmony and unity and peace shared by all people, something unparalleled in human history. So it's hard to understand exactly how it would come about, given the situation today, but we don't believe that it will come about through confrontation or through aggression. We believe that all that we can really do is have the faith and integrity to live as Jews should live, right. to adhere to the Word of God, and to do as best as possible that which is incumbent upon us to bring us closer to the time of the Temple. Rabbi, uh, there's also the issue uh, for the officiating in the Temple. The priesthood. Uh, could you speak to that? Uh, Dr. Hutchins has talked to me about that and has brought up some interesting scientific work that's being done to truly try to find who the true priests are and, and what, what can you enlighten us on what's going on with that area of your work? Yes, all of the people that are uh, officiating in the temple are descendants of Aaron and uh, the Kohanim as they're called um, all trace their lineage to Aaron. Now. Today, there are many people who do not know what their exact lineage is because of the whole concept of the Jewish experience over the millennia. Uh, many records were lost, there was much persecution, entire communities were destroyed. However, uh, many would be surprised to know that there are many Jewish families who do trace their lineage 
uh, very specifically. In fact, in Jewish family life, these things are very, very important. And there are obligations as well as privileges uh, for those that uh, are descendants of Aaron. And so this is something which has a, a manifestation on, a, on an everyday level. Um, I think it's very, very fascinating. And more than fascinating, I think it's really very, very inspiring when we reflect upon the fact that there are two verses in particular that I'm thinking, one in De Deuteronomy and one in Leviticus, that tell us, God tells us, I have an everlasting covenant between me and between Aaron and his sons forever. Now, just a number of years ago, in fact, it was less than three years ago, that a team of scientists and doctors working from the university at Haifa and the Technion and also a number of hospitals here in Israel uh, discovered that there's a particular chromosome which is shared by every male Jew in the world that no one else in the world has. That means that no other Jewish person or female Jew or any other person in the world has this chromosome. But every Jew who is descended from Aaron, whether he's white or black or of European ancestry or Spanish, all have this particular chromosome, which I think when we reflect upon those verses that God says, it's an eternal covenant between me and between Aaron and his sons forever, we might think, well, what does that mean today when the temple is in a state of ruins and hasn't yet been restored? Yet we see that the word of God, and I'm sure that your viewers would agree with me, never comes up empty. God doesn't have to say something twice. So he has this covenant, and it's stamped in the very flesh of these men waiting to be fulfilled. And they're carrying it with them forever because it's not dormant. It's just there, just needing to be activated because this is God's promise. Tell me what uh, work's been done and is being done in training the, the men that you have found with this chromosome, these, the Kohites, the Kohens. Mm -hmm. uh, wh where are we at in their development and training? Well, this training is not really all that unusual. It's something that's been a uh, part of Jewish curriculum for thousands of years. Today, there are young men in particular that are also uh, emphasizing this area of study because they are Kohanim. But it's not really such an unusual thing. And all throughout the millennia, since the destruction of the Second Temple, these things have been studied. Rabbi, we're hearing a lot now, or at least some, of what's going on in the Temple Mount today. Could you share with us, enlighten us on uh, your perspective of what's happening there? Unfortunately, this is a story that many people are not aware of, but there is a, a campaign of nothing less than what I would call vicious revisionist history being waged today by Islam to utterly eradicate, erase, and destroy every vestige of Jewish presence from the Temple Mount. You have to understand that the official policy of Islam is that there never was a temple on the Temple Mount. In the literature that is sold in the brochure, in the Al-Aqsa Museum, it says that there's no archaeological or historical evidence whatsoever for the temple ever having stood on the Temple Mount. Um, there are some people that deny the Holocaust, you know, but if you could find my grandfather, it would be a very good trick. So too, there are people who deny that the temple ever stood there. This is part of a much broader uh, issue, and that is, I believe, coming now towards the final status negotiations, the permanent uh, status negotiations of Jerusalem, the effort that Islam is making is to try to, um, through a very glib and slick PR machine, try to convince the world that Jerusalem is the holiest spot for the Islam, but that uh, Jewish history is, has no representation whatsoever in Jerusalem. If you go to the website today of the Palestine National Authority, you'll find out that Jerusalem is a 5,000-year-old Arab city and that it never was a Jewish city, that the Western Wall is merely the place where Muhammad hitched up his horse before he ascended to heaven, but there never was a holy temple. Now listen to what the chief Muslim authority says about the Temple Mount area and the city of Jerusalem. Today, by the will of Allah, regarding Al-Aqsa Mosque and Haram es Sharif, there is no place for other religions, neither for Jews nor Christians to have places of worship. It is only for Muslims. We respect other religions, we're not against others. But El Quds is an Islamic city religiously, politically, and culturally. It must be under Muslim authority. Now this is something which has been going on for many, many years. Although, ironically, the word Jerusalem is mentioned in the Bible over 700 times and zero times in the Quran. And in fact, the fixation or the interest that Islam has in Jerusalem is fairly recent. It's basically since we came back. Mm -hmm. But uh, what's really of vital importance for people to understand is what's going on today on the Temple Mount. First of all, one of the ironies is that when the Holy Temple stood, as Isaiah says, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. All people are welcome there to pray. Solomon, when he dedicated the first temple, the fire came down from heaven when he finished his prayer, said, 
Whoever comes also of the strangers from all over the world and faces this place, raises his hands to heaven, you and your heavens will hearken and hear his prayer. But today, only Muslim prayer is allowed on the Temple Mount. Christians and Jews are not allowed to pray on the Temple Mounts. We who appear to be Orthodox Jews who try to pray on the Temple Mount will be arrested and escorted off the Mount for the crime of trying to pray on the Temple Mount. Now for many years there has been an effort to destroy any uh, vestige that's been left from the time of the Temple, but that has moved now on to, into a new uh, stage completely because for the past uh, nine months or so, since around November, December of 99, there has been a whole project going on uh, being perpetrated by the Waqf, which is the Supreme Muslim Council on the Temple Mount, to destroy the subterranean evidence of the Temple Mount as well. And this began with the uh, opening of an entrance into the large mosque that they have built underground in the southern side of the Temple Mount, known as Solomon Stables, in uh, a, a, what I would call um, a, a campaign of destruction guised as renovation. Mm -hmm. They began to um, destroy uh, thousands of tons of remnants dating back not only from the second but from the first temple as well. They've been doing this in the dead of night with heavy machinery without allowing the Isra Israel Antiquities Authority, which by law is supposed to protect every antiquity in Israel, without allowing them any access. And to date, thousands and thousands of tons of fill from the Temple Mount, including precious remnants from the holy temples themselves, have been dumped in a series of makeshift dumps, garbage dumps, literally, around Jerusalem in the Kidron Valley and in the municipal dump of Jerusalem. First of all, I'm sad. I'm very sad. Once, uh, because uh, this is a marvelous place, the Valley of uh, Kidron, which is uh, spoiled by this uh, ugly uh, dumping of piles of uh, rubbish. But more than that, I'm sad because I know the origin of uh, this material. It originates in the uh, Temple Mount, in the southern par part of the Temple Mount. Uh, the Temple Mount is three times the size of the city of David in uh, Jerusalem and it is the core and heart of Jerusalem and heart of the uh, history of Jerusalem and the history of the uh, Jewish people and the Judeo-Christian as well as Muslim heritage in Jerusalem. And it is outrageous that an illicit dig uh, was carried out there. Uh, the dig was uh, done with uh, heavy machinery and uh, all that material was dumped here. And you can imagine in any country in the world, if a synagogue was vandalized, everybody would be up in arms and there would be a whole hue and cry. But here, they are taking the Holy of Holies, the thing which is the most significant to the Jewish people, and literally trashing it, and no one has a word to say. Um, I think it's important to point out also that um, when we reflect upon this destruction, you know, the temple is going to be rebuilt. That's not the problem. I know the end of the movie. We all know that the temple is going to be rebuilt because that's a divine promise. So the issue is not really the stones. You know, life is more important than the stones and the destiny that we've been entrusted to is more important. So it's not a question of the degradation of the stones, but more, I think the issue here is that it is a degradation to the honor of God. And that is what is so important for us to understand here. And that's why this whole issue is really of such significance for all Bible believers to understand what's going on. Because the fact that we've entered into this era now where the Muslims, who are waging war against the God of Israel, by waging war against Israel, that's what the Bible tells us, by their attacking the very foundation of God's throne on this earth, and not receiving any condemnation, being allowed to continue with impunity. The new era that we're in now is that they see that they're able to get away with this. And this is a tremendous degradation of God's name. And this has to be stopped. You know, Rabbi, there's Zionistic Jews here that aren't religious people, that have a different um, attitude about how to respond to this. Um, I'm wondering, as I hear this, I'm enraged, you know, what is, uh, how, how could you characterize the, uh, the attitude in, in, the, in the Jewish people in general with regard to this matter? What, what's happening here within the heart of the people with regard to this desecration of, really, it is an attack, I agree, against the Lord, but it's also an attack against the identity of the Jewish that's people. That's right, because, because Israel is a reflection of the honor of God, so that's a very, very important point. Um, 
What I think you have to understand is that every successive government in Israel since 1967 has essentially acted the, the role of the ostrich and had hit its head in the sand when it came to any, anything about the Temple Mount. They're kind of hoping that the whole thing will go away because it's such a sensitive issue. Um, the only person who has any authority, really, it's for the ultimate decision-making process of the Temple Mount is the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister reserves that authority for himself. And instantly, if he so desired, he could execute, he could employ and power Israeli law on the Temple Mount. But he chooses not to. And this is really the issue and the pressure that we have so far succeeded in our trying, hopefully with God's help, to continue to bring against him is for him to understand through public opinion that this is not going to be tolerated. And, and that's really the whole issue here, that he must be made to understand that he can't uh, come back from Camp David acting like a hero, saying, I fought like a lion for, for the holy things of Israel, for Jewish rights, and allow this kind of thing to happen. Yeah, he's already, it seems to me, uh backpedaled on the Temple Mount area with That's regard right. to letting Arafat even have a headquarters up there which would allow the ongoing desecration of the of the artifacts that are underground. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it is an amazing time that we live in. Something's going to break soon it seems and uh, we want to believe for the best. So thanks again. We know that there is going to have to be some kind of structure on the Temple Mount that will be recognized as the holy place during the middle point of the tribulation period. And at this time, there is going to be some world political and religious leader who is going to stand on this pot and declare that he is the Messiah, and everyone in the world is going to be commanded to worship him as God and take his mark and number. And that is the abomination. And according to the prophecies, a period of three and a half years of desolation will follow. And we also remember that Hosea said the Jews, or Israel, would be without a temple for two days, which according to Psalm 90 and 2 Peter 3, we believe to be 2,000 years. Well, that period is just about over. Therefore, we believe that this act to be committed by the Antichrist must be near at hand, and the rebuilding or building of some kind of structure on the controversial temple site that will be recognized as a holy place for Israel must be very, very near. يا حرقت انت عصر اه يا حبر القدر وشكيتك حال زعلا والامم اللي تحفر يا حرقت انت عصر اه يا حبر القدر يا حرقت انت عصر This ancient city called Petra is also called by other names in the Bible uh, Sila, Mount Hor, Mount Seir, the rock city of the Edomites, and many other names. In fact, other than Babylon and Jerusalem, this city is mentioned more times in the Bible than any other. This is one of the most interesting and mysterious ghost towns in all the world. It was a city lost in time for almost 1,500 years until it was rediscovered by a Swiss explorer in 1867. 
And there have been some interesting and notable guests who have been here in this city. We know that Job lived in the land of Uz in northern Arabia. And this city in biblical times was part of North Arabia. Also, we know that uh, the Edomites were here and Esau, the father of the Edomites, founded this very city. And later we know that Moses came through this area. In fact, part of the area is named for Moses. I and Moses, the Spring of Moses, the Valley of Moses. And also we know that uh, David was here for a time when he ran from Saul. This used to be a city of refuge. Also, we know that uh, Anthony and Cleopatra was here. In fact, Anthony incurred the wrath of the Roman Senate for giving this city to his lover, Cleopatra. And we know that King Herod was here. Josephus brings that out about King Herod coming down to this place. Also, King Herod was an Edomite. And we know that Paul was here. He uh, escaped from Damascus and spent three years in this city. And then later the Crusaders and others, and today, Millions of people from all over the world come to visit this most interesting and amazing city. The most important guests are yet to come. We know that Israel, during the diaspora, many times has needed a hiding place. And according to the prophets, during the last half of the tribulation period, the time of Jacob's trouble, Israel will be here in this place. A remnant will be here in this place for three years protected by God until the Messiah comes. And then he will lead them, the remnant, back to Israel and the prophecies concerning this most interesting and mysterious city will have been fulfilled. Petra is one of the most interesting prophetic presentations that you will ever view.